Good morning. I'm so happy to see all of you this morning. Uh, last week I returned from Almaty, Kazakhstan, attending the Central Asian Regional Conference, and about 130 persons were there, mostly from Muslim-dominated countries in Central Asia. And it was a beautiful, wonderful conference. Um, God is working in so many ways in Central Asia in answer to prayer. And I met a young man, uh, his name is, is Bolat. And I first met him about three years ago when, when Dr. Mark Young and I held an inductive Bible study workshop in Astana. And at that time he was uh, silent for three days. He didn't say anything during the whole uh, workshop. But this year, he delivered the message on Jesus' crucifixion. And his message was so heart moving and so beautiful. I was totally amazed. I saw the miracle of God in this person's life. And he is now officially the director of Astana One Chapter after missionary David Bian moved from Kazakhstan to Boston last week. So I feel that I've seen the miracle of God with my own eyes. And so many amazing things are happening in Central Asia. Thank you so much for your prayers. Today we come to chapter 14 in John's Gospel. And my message title is, Jesus said, I am the way. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your mercy and love through our Lord Jesus. Thank you for giving your life as a ransom for us and calling us into your presence as your children to listen to your voice, to worship you, and to follow you. Please help me today to deliver this message. And please speak to our hearts. Draw us near to you in worship, adoration, praise. Please bless us and guide us. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I'm going to give a pop quiz. Who can guess what the key verse is for today's passage? Any guesses? Verse 6, right? Is there any possible other key verse in this passage? Yeah, our key verse is verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. May we read this together, please? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' words, I am the way, are one of the seven I am statements of John's Gospel. This statement is very significant when spoken in our culture, which emphasizes diversity and tolerance. In many ways, this cultural emphasis is good. It has helped people break down human barriers and see the world from new perspectives. We can experience the beauty of God's world in a much fuller way. However, in terms of salvation, Jesus clearly says, He is the way. He is not one of many ways. He is the only way. Now, it's true that some people use this truth as a theological argument, like a hammer, in an overly simplistic evangelistic approach. And this is why so many people react negatively, thinking it's too narrow a viewpoint 
which only fosters bigotry and ignorance. But this is not at all what Jesus had in mind. In fact, Jesus' word came from his deep love to lead people to salvation. We need to consider his claim prayerfully and thoughtfully. There are two questions in this passage which Jesus answers. Thomas's question and Philip's question. Their questions are very relevant to us. Jesus' answers give living hope, clear life direction, and eternal salvation. Let's listen to Jesus' words. First, Jesus comforts his disciples. What does Jesus do? Comforts. Wow, it's beautiful. Comfort. He began in verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Why were the disciples' hearts troubled? As we saw in chapter 13, the table talk at the Last Supper had not been so uplifting. Rather, it was gloomy and sorrowful. Jesus had predicted his imminent death through Judas' betrayal and foretold Peter's denial. And most troubling to the disciples was that they did not know where Jesus was going. And they were not allowed to follow him at that time. When they heard these things, they felt they were being abandoned with no direction. And they're on the verge of despair, even depression. At this moment, Jesus comforted them with great hope. Jesus wanted them to trust in him as they trusted in God, indicating he is God. Jesus always wanted his disciples to have faith in him instead of falling into anxiety over the situation. This word speaks to us also. Sometimes we face uncertainty about the future. The economy fluctuates. The political situation is dark. Some Christian leaders have stumbled. And many people feel they cannot trust anyone or anything. But in such moments, Jesus wants us to trust in him. This is how we can overcome doubt, anxiety, and fear. Do not let your hearts be troubled. It's Jesus' imperative. It means that we must decide not to let our hearts be troubled by trusting in Jesus. Satan attacks us in many ways, trying to plant doubt, fear, and anxiety. But we must guard our hearts by trusting in Jesus. After planting faith, Jesus gave them hope by promising them a room in the Father's house. He said, my Father's house has many rooms. The words, my Father's house, refer to the kingdom of God in a very personal and intimate way. It is the perfect paradise where our Father dwells with us and cares for us. It is a safe place, and his children love him and love one another and live in harmony all the time. The Father's house has many rooms. These rooms are not little box rooms. They're beautiful, spacious mansions 
surrounded by delightful gardens, and the streets are made of gold. No more pothole problems. <laughs> there is no pollution, no disease, no crime, no pain, no mourning, no death. It is full of life, love, peace, and joy. This is our eternal dwelling place. In this world, nothing is permanent, and we cannot keep anything forever. Eventually, we will all die. Do you believe this? I was surprised that our singer, Jonathan, is going to be 54 years old. Wow. He's not going to live forever in this world. And neither am I, and neither are you. However, we have hope to dwell in our Father's house forever, where nothing will perish, nothing will spoil, and nothing will fade. Apostle Paul says, For we know that if this earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. This hope is freely given to those who believe in Jesus Christ. How can we be sure of this? It is because Jesus said so. Who said so? Jesus. Jesus said so. Jesus always tells the truth. He never lies. His promise is trustworthy. If we hold on to his promise, we will never be disappointed. Jesus said, if that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for, for you? In other words, I told you. You should believe it. Then Jesus gave them another great promise. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. This implies Jesus' death would not be the end. Jesus died for our sins on the cross. After that, he rose again and ascended into heaven. And he will come with great power and glory as King of kings and Lord of lords with thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful uh, assembly with him. Wow, he's coming for you. He's coming for me. And he's going to take us to be with him. It's really a great hope. It's not a dead hope. It's not like the Cubs winning the World Series hope. It's a living hope. And when we have this living hope in our hearts, we can overcome hardship. We can live victoriously for the glory of God. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us such a wonderful hope. Second, Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. After making wonderful promises, Jesus told his disciples, you know the way to the place where I am going. On what basis did he say this? From the beginning of his ministry, Jesus had taught through word and deed that he came from God and was going back to God and that he was the way to eternal salvation. For example, Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep. 
Whoever enters through me will be saved. He also said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. Though Jesus had fully revealed himself, the way of eternal salvation, Thomas did not understand what Jesus was talking about. Now, Thomas was an honest man, and he spoke his mind freely. He said, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? On the surface, it, this question seems legitimate. But in fact, it came from his unbelief. To him, the Father's house seems so abstract, not real. Jesus' resurrection and his return seemed like a fairy tale to him. In reality, he did not want to accept Jesus' death or his own death. Even though Jesus tried to comfort him, he could not receive it because he was scared to death. This is why the Father's house seems so vague and irrelevant to him. We can understand, Thomas. If we don't accept the truth of Jesus' death and resurrection, or our own death, the Father's house seems like a myth. Instead of having hope in the Father's house, we try to escape the reality of death by having some kind of false hope. Like Thomas, we are vulnerable to the fear of death. Let's listen carefully to Jesus' words that we may overcome the fear of death with a living hope in the Father's house. Anyway, because Thomas asked this question, Jesus revealed a profound truth about himself. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' declaration about himself is amazing. Throughout history, no one could say, I am the way. These days, religious pluralism is dominant. Many people practice a smorgasbord religion picking bits of pieces and pieces of good teachings from various sources and putting them all together. And people like to say, there are many different pathways to the top of the mountain. Though different, they all lead to the same place. Samuel Palaka of India told us about one person he shared the gospel with. The person accepted Jesus as God and said, now I have 692 gods, including Jesus. Our Lord Jesus Christ made it plain. We should not believe in him plus any other God or any other way. Jesus is the only way to God. Acts 4.12 says, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. The Bible says salvation is found in no one else. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God. How many gods? One, one God and one mediator. How many mediators? One. Between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. So why is Jesus the only way? Here we must consider the uniqueness of Jesus. Only Jesus came from God and went back to God. Only Jesus 
is in very nature fully man and fully God. Only Jesus died as a perfect sacrifice for our sin. Only Jesus defeated the power of death through his resurrection from the dead. Only Jesus gives the Holy Spirit to those who believe in him. Only Jesus has the authority to give eternal life to those who believe in him and to judge those who reject him. Only Jesus, ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and intercedes for us as our great high priest. Jesus alone is the new and living way through whom we can draw near to God. Through Jesus alone, we can approach God's throne of grace with confidence and find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Do you need grace? Do you need mercy from God? You're not so sure? Why are you here? Do you need mercy? and grace from God? The only way is through Jesus Christ. And he is faithful. And when you come to him, he will give you grace and mercy in your time of need. I promise this because the Bible says that it's true. Don't go somewhere else don't go to the television. Don't go to Oprah. Don't go to some philosopher. Don't go to some educator. Don't go to some politician for crying out loud. Only Jesus gives us grace and mercy from God our Father in heaven. The way is related to the truth and the life. When we know the way, it leads us to the truth and gives life. The truth and the life are important themes in John's Gospel. The word truth appears 23 times, more than in any other book in the Bible. The word life appears 41 times, more than any other book in the New Testament. In fact, Jesus himself is the truth and is the life. His words are truth that give us life. He said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. In him was life, and that life is the light of all mankind. Jesus said, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. What could be more valuable than truth and life? We do not find these in the world. We find these in Jesus Christ. When Jesus said, I am the way, it does not mean that he is simply a path to God. Instead, he himself is the ultimate destination. That is why he said, if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Knowing Jesus is the way of knowing the Father. We need not try to know the Father in some other way. If we know Jesus, we know the Father simultaneously. 
Knowing God and knowing Christ is the way of eternal life. It is the most important for every person. As we begin a new semester, many students who are thirsty for the truth will enter our universities and are really seeking God in their hearts. Let's pray. They may know Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Third, Jesus and the Father are one. As soon as Jesus said that knowing him was knowing the Father, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. Jesus just said, you have seen him. And Philip said, show us the Father. He didn't accept Jesus' word. Why? He had a concept of God that was majestic and glorious. He must have thought about how God revealed himself at Mount Sinai in an impressive display of power. The mountain shook, the atmosphere filled with holy smoke, and there was thunder and lightning. Wow. Or he may have thought of the glorious visions of Isaiah or Ezekiel. He wanted Jesus to show that kind of revelation. But when he saw Jesus, Jesus was so poor. And his clothes were always shabby, not always matching. His shoes had holes. And he was constantly dealing with rejection and suffering. He didn't look like God. Don't we have the same tendency? We want to see Jesus' glorious image in a supernatural way. Yet we really need to pay attention to what Jesus says. Everyone has a deep desire to see God because we are made in God's image. And it's at the very core of our identity. The question is, how? Jesus said in verse 9, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. It was a kind of rebuke. Actually, Jesus had revealed himself to his disciples in many ways. Through his life together with them, his words, his actions, and especially his miracles. They saw God in Jesus. However, Philip spoke as though he had never seen God in Jesus. Like Philip, Sometimes our spiritual eyes are closed to God's presence with us. God manifests himself in many, many ways, through nature, through people, through events, at a Bible conference, and so on. And especially, God speaks to us through his written words in the Bible but we can be totally unaware of God's presence due to our spiritual dullness. One person has been showered by God's words and loved by God's servants in so many ways, but he felt that God had abandoned him because his eyes were fixed on his idol. Only recently has he come to realize that God has been with him patiently and faithfully to purify his heart out of great love. Let's pray that the Lord may give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so we may know him better. 
Let's pray that the Lord may open the eyes of our hearts so we may see him and how he is working in our lives. After rebuking Philip, Jesus planted the truth once again. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? He repeats this twice and the same idea three times. Simply speaking, Jesus is declaring he is God incarnate. No one has ever seen God. But Jesus came into the world to make God known to us. Why is it so important to believe that Jesus is God? If Jesus is God, he is the object of praise, adoration, and worship. He gives our lives absolute meaning and purpose and is worthy of our full commitment. Our creator, our redeemer. Yet like Philip, some Christians think they are not fully satisfied by Jesus. In truth, it is a lack of commitment to Jesus. When we commit ourselves to Jesus, our souls are satisfied. In verses 10 and 11, Jesus gives three proofs to support his claim to have union with the Father. First, his words. The words of famous human beings are often empty, but Jesus' words are full of understanding and wisdom. Jesus' words give us life. His words have power to transform us. Through his word, our sins are forgiven and our souls are revived. Jesus' word is God's word. Second, on the basis of his person, his identity and character. Jesus is the sinless son of God and the manifestation of perfect integrity. Even his enemies acknowledge this. Finally, it is on the basis of his works, from changing water to wine, to the feeding of the 5,000, to the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Jesus had done works that only God could do. Jesus did all these things so that we may believe in him and have life in his name. In verses 12 through 14, Jesus gave great promises to those who believe in him. Wow, despite the disciples' unbelief and lack of commitment, Jesus encouraged them to become great men of faith. In verse 12, Jesus said, Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. When we simply believe in Jesus, we can do what Jesus did and even greater things than Jesus. Not in quality, but in quantity. Jesus' works on earth were limited in time and space. He ministered for three years, mainly among the people of Israel. But we have more than three years, and we can go all over the world. Jesus does not want us to be mediocre. He wants us to be great men and women of faith, to do great things for God by faith in him. Please turn to your neighbor and say, 
Do great things for God. You know, faith makes people great. Do you want to be really great? Not sure? Have faith in Jesus. And faith in Jesus will make you great. In verses 13 and 14, Jesus tells how we can do great things for God. He said, and I will do, right? I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Wow, this tells the power of prayer. What do you think of when you think of prayer? Just speaking words in the air? Pardon? God hears. Amen. God hears. When we pray, God hears. Charles Spurgeon said, prayer is the slender nerve that moves the mighty muscle of omnipotence. The purpose of prayer is not just to get what we want. It's to bring glory to the Father through Jesus Christ. Sometimes, even though we pray earnestly, God's answer is not what we expected. It's easy to doubt God and to lose heart. But we must acknowledge God's will is deeper and higher than we can comprehend. We should trust in God in any situation. We are living in an era of uncertainty. Everything in the world changes like shifting shadows. Many people wander without knowing the meaning and purpose of their lives, and they suffer from fear and anxiety. But Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. When we come to Jesus, we find the true way of life and living hope in the Father's house. We can live dynamic lives and do great things for God. Let's trust in Jesus. Let's trust in Jesus. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the wonderful truth of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us so plainly, you are the way to the Father. And through you, we have life and we have living hope in your kingdom. You have given us everything in Jesus. Please help us not to be half-hearted, but to be fully committed to Jesus. Please help us not to escape reality, but to embrace the gospel message, really believe it in our hearts, and live by faith in Jesus Christ. Please raise us as those who can do great things for Jesus and reveal your glory, manifest your amazing power and your deep love in our lives, in our ministry. May you receive all glory, honor, and praise. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.